Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The objectives of this presentation are to identify the location and position of our maxillary central and lateral incisors, to illustrate and define the morphology and terminology of these individual teeth, to point out some identifying characteristics of these teeth, and to discuss some of the drawing criteria for these teeth. If we were to look to a skull, we could identify the position of these rather easily. There are maxillary four anterior teeth. We have them by number seven, which is our maxillary right lateral incisor, eight, maxillary right central incisor, and the same on the other side, nine and 10. These four anterior teeth being incisors are involved with our cutting of our food or our biting or incising. They're involved rather significantly with our aesthetics and personality identification. These are the teeth that show most prominently in a smile. We also have significant value of these teeth in relation to our speech and phonetics and the proper enunciation of certain speech sounds. We'll study the relationship of our maxillary incisors to our mandibular incisors when we study mandibular incisors. In this presentation, we're gonna be concerned mainly with the terminology. We have a large group of new terms which are characteristic for our incisor teeth. Let's look at some extracted teeth now, and we'll go over the individual terminology and try to point it out and review it here with you. And we'll be adding more terminology as we go. And then eventually we'll start to find out how these characteristics vary actually from tooth to tooth, central to uh, lateral, mandibular to maxillary. Here we actually have a tooth that has some amylons on. You won't find these as you study uh, extracted teeth. It's very rare. This is the first one I've seen at all. But uh, we did find one. And, and actually, we talked about the sections that these teeth divide into in thirds. We've got these grooves or depressions that come up here, the uh, mesial labial and the distal labial grooves. This kind of divides it into thirds. And we we're talking about a mesial third and a middle third and a distal third. Uh, sometimes these thirds are called lobes around the developmental growth centers. So you could ha see this referred to as a distal lobe. We don't very often see mammalons in the mouth. Occasionally we'll see them for a few months during the eruption of the teeth in youngsters. In this instance here, we have a 23-year-old woman who is still showing mammalons. But she has an open bite and hasn't been able to get her anterior teeth together at all. Although in her left central incisor here, you can see that these mammalons are starting to wear off. Usually these mammalons will wear off within a matter of a few months after the teeth have erupted into the mouth and start occluding. Actually, we should at this time start to identify the mesial from distal for you. And in the labial view, and this being the labial, I think you can determine labial on this tooth rather easily. But uh, as we study the labial view of other teeth, and particularly the facial and buccal view of the posterior teeth, this becomes much more difficult to uh, uh, identify. These we see in people's mouths every day, and it's uh, rather easy. But on our labial surface here, we have two angles, and the angles are simply named by the surfaces which come in contact to them. Uh, one surface which we should identify before we even identify the angles here, I guess, is our incisal. The biting edge of these teeth is called the incisal. And this can be referred to either as an edge, incisal edge, or an incisal ridge. There is a little bit of difference between them. A ridge is generally a non-worn, rounded surface, like the ridges in the mountains in Tennessee or something. But an edge is actually a, a flattened surface that has been worn. And we'll go into the differences of that uh, here later. But they could be generally referred to as an incisal ridge or an incisal edge, certainly the incisal portion of the tooth here. But on these angles now, 
the mesial incisal angle, that's the two areas in which it's closest to, the mesial incisal angle is sharp, and the distal incisal angle is considerably rounded. And generally just the central area here would be the distal incisal angle. But this is the most prominent way to tell the difference between mesial and distal on these two teeth. If we were to look at a outline of this labial surface, we would see that our labial is rather smoothly convexed. And our incisal edge is lying pretty much over the center of the root of the tooth. Our lingual surface has a concavity in here and is rather significantly different in shape from the labial. Now one of the things we like to point out to you on these are the heights of contours of these teeth. And this seems to be a difficult concept for some to uh, understand. So let me show you with a little bully gauge here what we're referring to. If you take a parallel beak instrument, such as your bully gauge, and lay it on your tooth, it will generally touch the tooth at the widest point. This widest point is called the height of contour. And on our labial surface, this is distinctly in the cervical third of the tooth. Same on the lingual surface as far as that's concerned in these teeth. This doesn't occur in the same place in all different teeth. Uh, but here it is distinctly in the cervical third of the tooth. If we look at the labial surface here and put the bowling gauge on the mesial and distal outlines here, we find that we have height of contours which are again different. On the mesial surface, this height of contour is very close to the incisal edge. This is contacting the adjacent central in the mouth. On the distal surface, our height of contour drops down a little further onto the distal surface. This is contacting a smaller lateral incisor. Now, where these points touch, if the tooth is in the mouth straight, we have what is generally referred to as our contact areas. If it was very crooked or out of position, it could have a different contact area. But generally, the contact areas will be at these height of contours on it. Now we could uh, draw in a couple areas here. How about if I were to draw in this area? What would we term this? We have the sharp angle here. And this is a angle of our box. So we'd have our mesial, labial, line angle. And we'd do the same on the distal portion of the surface of the tooth. We'd have our distal labial line angle. We've got our two grooves, distal labial groove and mesial labial groove. We've got a cervical line, which we can recognize on this tooth. And notice how the cervical line actually is going. It's at its most apical portion, right in the center of the uh, crown here, or in the middle third, I guess you would say, of the crown, to get our proper terminology on it. Let's turn over to the lingual surface and see if we can identify some of the anatomy on the lingual surface here. Lingual surface is characterized, in this view, by having a rather strong protuberance right here. This protuberance is probably the most characteristic area on the lingual surface. And this is our fourth growth center, actually. And it didn't really grow too much in this tooth. As we go to some of our other teeth, we'll find that this actually grows into a full-size cusp, or a point which is equally as high as the uh, incisal edge. But it's a, a growth center which grows a little bit. This is called the cingulum. This is a very important terminology. Cingulum is this whole area around here. The height of contour is on the cingulum, but on the lower portion of the cingulum, down towards the cervical line. It gets a little easier to talk about these once we start identifying some of this terminology, because we can refer from one to another. We've got some ridges that occur on this lingual surface. And these are called ridges according to the surface they're on. We've got a mesial marginal ridge get over to the pointed side here so we can get our mesial, mesial marginal ridge and a distal marginal ridge. We've got some general areas on this lingual surface which is this whole depressed area in here. 
And this is a fossa. A fossa is a general depression. So we've got a lingual fossa. Sometimes this lingual fossa will end up in a little bit of an apex or a very sharp point. And this would, would be referred to as a lingual pit. We haven't got a real strong lingual pit on this area. Pit is more of a point rather than a general depressed area. So those are our basic terms on the lingual. We've got a cingulum, our mesial and distal marginal ridges, our lingual fossa, this whole scooped out area, and a lingual pit, if it's a point or if it's present in a small area. We have our cervical line, very similar to the labial, and it also goes towards the apex the most in the middle third of the tooth. Now, if we were to look at this cervical as we tip over here to the mesial and follow the cervical line around here, we would find that it, it comes up closer to the incisal edge as it comes to the mesial. So it's a continuous curve going up and down as it comes around the tooth. And this is very important. You'll have to uh, know exactly where that is uh, in order to do operative and periodontal and uh, other uh, services to this tooth. But if we look at the mesial surface here, we'll find that there's not a lot of strong characteristics to it and not a lot of specific terminology that we haven't covered, but our mesial contact area would be the strongest single term on this tooth, which is usually at the height of contour. This as we showed on the Bowley gauge. The distal surface has a little bit of difference here. One of the differences is that uh, our cemento enamel junction or our cervical line here doesn't come as close to the incisal edge on the distal as it does on the mesial. On the mesial this dips rather close to the incisal edge and usually closer than on the distal and you frequently can distinguish this uh, as a characteristic. In other words, if this tooth was worn off right down to here you'd have a a little bit of difficulty telling which of these angles were the sharpest. You'd have to start to look towards other characteristics. And this is one of the characteristics that uh, you can use for identification. It's one you also have to be aware of in doing uh, crown preparations and other things on these teeth. But we've got our distal contact area on this distal surface, which is usually further from the incisal edge or a little lower. This is contacting a smaller lateral incisor. And as we go posterior, sometimes this has a tendency to get closer to the cervical. I say lower, I mean closer to the cervical uh, actually here. If we look at an incisal view, another tooth here, we can see the position of the cingulum in relation to the tooth. The cingulum is either, either centrally located on this lingual surface or sometimes it has a tendency to be located off towards the distal a little bit. This is in line with the curvature of the arch that is occurring here but the mass of it frequently will be a little bit to the lingual. In relation to this incisal edge here, we can have, as I said, either an edge or a ridge. And on our non-worn teeth, we've got a rounded area up here, which is called a ridge, technically. And in a tooth that has had quite a little wear to it, we get a flat surface on here. And this wears frequently to the lingual side because of the way the lower teeth come out over it in occlusion. And so we've got an edge that tapering to the lingual. And it's uh, generally referred to as an incisal edge. Actually, you'll find that sometimes this terminology will become even more uh, specific. As so much as when they're talking about the incisal edge, they could talk about the labial incisal edge, which is the edge right in between the labial surface and the incisal, and the lingual incisal edge, which would be the flattened edge towards the lingual of the incisal. I don't think these two terms are spelled out specifically for you in cards or handouts and sometimes aren't real specific in, in the literature, but you occasionally will hear people refer to the labial incisal edge or lingual incisal edge, and they're actually breaking this flattened surface down into uh, two edges. Let's look at the root portion of this tooth a little bit. The roots are characteristically cone-shaped, frequently having a fairly blunt apex. This doesn't usually come real pointed, and it doesn't usually curve one way or another, although you find many 
variations on it. Looking at our outline form, we'll find that as we compare the crown and root totally on the mesial, that we have a very small dip at the cervical of the tooth on the mesial surface. But as we look to the distal, usually this becomes a little bit more prominent and we'll pick up just a little bit more of a concavity in between the crown and the root right at the cervical line or the cervical area of the tooth. Another thing in relation to this root that I think is uh, quite important is the fact that through our labial surface here, we're quite broad. And this actually becomes flattened in through the labial surface on the root structure, at least in the uh, cervical third of the root. And as we look to the lingual, this becomes very rounded and actually gives us a triangular root with a broad labial surface and a rather narrow lingual surface. Another thing on these central incisors I should try to clarify a little bit, and that's the difference in terminology between our line angles and our marginal ridges. Uh, on the lingual surface, this becomes a, a problem sometimes. If we were to consider our marginal ridges as being the height of our ridge on the lingual surface, we actually would have a different area in relation to our line angle, the line angle being the junction between the two surfaces, the our mesial surface and our lingual surface here, our line angle actually would be out more in this area here. And sometimes this gets confusing to students, particularly if they're asked to identify the difference between these two uh, on an examination or something. We'll try not to get quite that confusing for you, but the line angle is actually the two surfaces. We'd have a mesial lingual line angle and the red one would be your mesial marginal ridge. Now we can look at our maxillary lateral incisors. It has basically all the same terminology. But now that we have the terminology somewhat in hand, we can start to use this in referring to the teeth and in describing them. We'll do more of a comparison study of the centrals and laterals rather than going through all the basic terminology on it, pointing out the differences uh, on these teeth, basically. Now, these are the maxillary lateral incisors we're looking at now, and this would be tooth number 7 and 10 in the mouth. This particular one's our left, so this is number 10 here. We'll note that in kind of a comparison here that our lateral is smaller. It's smaller in mesial distal width uh, rather significantly. It frequently, at least in the mouth, is a little bit shorter than the central, unless the teeth have gotten worn and then they'll wear down rather evenly. But this leaves our contact a little bit lower on the central and leaves it about in this area on the lateral here. Now as we go to the distal of the lateral, we'll be contacting a cuspid and our contact becomes closer to the cervical even yet. So we've got a difference in height of contours or our contact areas uh, in the normal occlusion within this tooth, just similar to what we had in the central, except neither one of them are quite as close to the incisal. We have the same differences as far as our incisal angles are concerned. Our mesial incisal angle is sharper than our distal incisal angle. But generally, neither one of these angles are as sharp as we get in the uh, central incisors, particularly our mesial uh, incisal angle. It just never gets quite as sharp as our angle in the central, which is the sharpest of them all. The root length in general is equal to or a little longer than the central incisor. And it's not nearly as broad up in the cervical portion, and so it gives it just a little bit of a peculiarly different shape. And Oftentimes, the root will have a little bit of a tendency to curve in the apical, very apical section of the tooth. And this curve practically always goes to the distal. You can always find freaks that will go to the mesial or what have you, but uh, um, a high 90% of the time this is going towards the distal. Our tooth in the root surface, since we're on it here, is generally more oval. We don't get this broad, flat area on the labial surface that we oftentimes have in the central. This has a tendency to become a little bit more oval, and uh, it's the same on the lingual surface. And so the whole cross-section, if we were to take a cross-section through the tooth, uh, 
would have a, instead of being a triangular root, more of an oval root on this. Well, let's look at some of the other anatomy on this tooth. Some of the more characteristic anatomy on it occurs on the lingual surface here. And this is characterized by having rather heavy marginal ridges. These mesial and distal marginal ridges are sometimes very heavy. And it's the heaviest of any tooth uh, in the mouth as far as your anterior teeth are concerned, the marginal ridges. Oftentimes this fossa is accentuated and enlarged, or not really larger, but deepened. It's just a deeper concavity and often ends up into a rather sharp pit. You can see the pit on this one, it's actually black. Many times this uh, will require restoration. So oftentimes we'll have a very distinct lingual pit with rather distinct marginal uh, grooves, marginal ridges, excuse me, on this surface, lingual surface. We have similar effect as far as our cervical line is concerned. Our cervical line comes closer to the incisal on the mesial portion of the tooth. And on the distal portion, it doesn't come quite as high. But we have basically the same curvature to this. In looking at your tooth, we frequently will find a distinct roll right at the cervical line where the cementum and the enamel joint at our spental enamel junction there. This becomes very characteristic and is very important. Our height of contours are about the same. They're on the cervical third on the labial and on the lingual it's on the cervical third also in the cingulum. The only significant difference would be our height of contours on the mesial and distal and they're in the same approximate proportion but both of them a little closer to the cervical, not quite as close to the incisal edge. I think this root structure being oval is rather important because this is an easy tooth to confuse with uh, other teeth and if you have it in your hand to look at you'll find that uh, these are not actually uh, flattened or ribbon shaped. They haven't got grooves down them but it is an oval root and this makes our internal pulp canal very similar in shape and if we're doing internal endodontics we've got uh, a similar shaped canal to work with than what we do on our outer uh, aspect of the root here. Actually we should take some time and study this pulp morphology. The actual shape of our pulp becomes of extreme importance when doing clinical restorative dentistry. That is when we're doing fillings or crowns on these teeth because we have to know exactly where this pulp is because we do not want to enter it mechanically. If we do, we frequently will get bacteria into the pulp from the saliva and the pulp will infect and in turn become painful and die and we have a, an abscess too. Same thing occurs if decay were to progress to the point where it involved the pulp. We'd leak in bacteria and end with an abscess. If and when this does occur, we may have to go to what is called a root canal procedure or a root canal filling. Sometimes it's called an endodontic filling in which we open into our pulp cavity from the lingual and here we'd open right through the lingual fossa and then go in and remove the remaining pulp tissue or the dead pulp tissue and sterilize it and place a filling. And actually this filling completely fills this pulp cavity right down to the tip of the apex. Let's take a look at this particular section here and identify the section. This is a labial aspect of our central incisor and we have ground off half of the labial surface. This is termed at this stage a mesial distal section. So we're looking at the pulp through a mesial distal section. Our two main terms to our pulp include our pulp chamber which is generally the portion of the pulp cavity which is in the coronal part of the tooth or near the crown. When we say coronal, we're meaning crown portion of the tooth. And it's usually a little wider and broader area in the tooth. And then we have our root canal, which is generally that part that is involved in the root and frequently will be in the shape of the root. That's one way we can help to remember the shapes of our root canals and actually pulp chambers too. That is that they basically follow the external 
morphology or shape of the tooth itself. In our central, we, you know, we have a triangular root on this. We frequently will have a triangular root canal on the internal aspect of the tooth. We've got a couple additional terms. One we introduced earlier, and this is the foramen at the end here, where the tooth exits from the tooth. This is called our apical foramen. The other is an area in the crown of the tooth, actually a projection out of our pulp chamber. And this we refer to as a pulp horn. Here we have a mesial pulp horn and a distal pulp horn. And these two teeth normally will have the two pulp horns. If we were to look at another section here, we would call this section a labial lingual section. We have taken the mesial surface and ground it off, or actually we've sectioned the tooth in two from the labial to the lingual. And in this area, we can also see that in the pulp chamber air aspect of our uh, pulp cavity, we have a broader, wider area in the tooth, and then this narrows down as it comes into the root canal and narrows as the tooth narrows as we come to the apex. Now our lateral incisor, our pulp, again, has all the same basic terminology and generally the same basic pulp horns, although it doesn't show real clear here. You usually have a mesial and distal pulp horn here also. But our pulp is not in a, a basically triangular cross section. It has the same shape as the root of our tooth, which is more of an oval or egg-shaped canal. Now, when doing root canal procedures on these teeth, this is usually done, of course, by feel. There's no way we have of looking internally into the tooth to see what actually is going on in the tooth. So this is basically a feeling procedure, and we must know the shape of these cavities, uh, our entire pulp cavity, before we get involved in trying to clean it out and uh, sh make it into various shapes and sterilize it and fill it. Looks that you do some drawings of these teeth. Not that we're anxious to have you become artist or sketch artist, but that we're anxious to have you start to identify certain characteristics on these teeth. Some of the characteristics which we'll be basically looking for will be the sharpness of your incisal angles. Mesial should be rather significantly sharper than your distal. Heights of contour. Our mesial height of contour should be much closer to the incisal than our distal height of contour. Cervical lines, we would expect that the cervical would have a tendency to dip towards the root apex as we came into the middle portion of our labial surface. These are basically the type of characteristics which we feel that you should recognize in a drawing and we would like to have drawings of several views before you actually go to trying to carve and wax these down and wax. Another view which I think is important is our mesial view on these in which we would anticipate finding a height of contour out on the labial surface in the cervical third of the tooth and having this round up to the incisal edge and in this instance we've got a ridge actually if we were to have an edge on here we would have an edge which would be wearing to the lingual surface. Having a height of contour on your lingual, which is again in the cervical third, having our incisal edge or ridge approximately over the center of the root structure, and having our cervical line coming closest to the incisal edge in the center portion of the tooth. These are the types of views we would expect. If we were to be drawing a incisal view, we could probably attempt to see on the central that our cingulum would have a tendency to be swung over to the distal a little bit more prominently. So if our incisal edge was carrying in through here, we'd have a little bit longer of a lingual, pardon me, a mesial marginal ridge on the mesial lingual than we would on the distal marginal ridge, having the apex of our triangle located a little bit closer to what we would label as distal. We hope this information will aid you 
in the study of your maxillary incisors. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.